Hey, I'm Ryan with Sawdust and Stuff, and welcome to my shop. Today I want to show you quickly how I go about using my CNC machine to make this cedar jack-o'-lantern that sells like crazy around fall. Last year I sold 250 or so of these. I also listed my files available online. They're set up to be used with a cedar fence picket 1x6x6, and uh, that's all you need to know. This video will tell you the rest. Go ahead and stay with me if you're interested in paying off your one penny machine in one weekend's worth of time. I should add before we get to the project, this is a very easy project. I know it's not high end, I know it's a low cost, I know that it's very easy to design these files, but what I've done is made it as easy to use as possible for the newbies, the beginners, those in woodshop class, those doing a project with your kids. My file is designed to save you a few minutes of time. That's it. Go ahead, design your own file, use the same tutorial, you'll be great, they'll sell great. I just wanted to point out, I know it's not a high end file, but it will save you some time. So we'll start with where you download the files for my purposes. Again, if you don't buy the files, you can still follow this tutorial, uh, but this is meant for the files as a tutorial, so I'm gonna go with that route. What you'll do is you'll open up the zip file. Uh, I'm using set of one, and at the very bottom, you'll find one labeled set of seven, my best sellers. Go ahead and open that up. I'm opening it up in vCarve here. And what you'll find is a set of seven lanterns designed with the faces and with the cut lines both of which are pre-programmed. So you'll just go over to your vCarve uh, toolpath setup and you've got profile one and profile two. Profile one is the cut lines. Those will be quick cut, 0.05 depth, really a one minute, not even job. Profile two is gonna get you all the face designs and what those look like cut out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna preview the toolpaths and here's what you'll get with my file is you'll export these toolpaths onto your machine and they are ready to cut. So we're gonna do that. All you're gonna do is go over in vCarve. Again, you may have another software, you should know how to do that. And you'll go click both of these. I have these both uh, programmed in to run with the Mini Jenny made by Cadence Manufacturing. Um, it's a great bit. I use it for all my lanterns. These files are designed to be used exclusively with the Mini Jenny. And then you're gonna go and you're gonna find your USB drive. I'm gonna save it just as it is, set of seven, my best sellers. Hit save, and then you'll go ahead and eject your mass storage, pull it out, and let's run to the machine. So then we're just gonna plug this in to the Onefinity. We gotta let it buffer for just a minute before it'll pop up here and recognize what's going on. And then you'll just go ahead and hit the import files find set of seven, my best sellers. It's the one I'm carving and import that into the machine. Once you've got it imported into the machine correctly, you'll need to do a few things. Um, first, you'll see the time to run this file. All seven lanterns takes 26 minutes and one second. You'll get seven lanterns out of that cut and you'll be using two pieces of 30 inch material. That is what less than one fence picket total. The fence pickets in my area cost about four bucks. You'll also need to home the machine if you do that, and you'll need to zero the bit of the machine before you cut. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you how I attach the pieces to my material with this file, and then how I go about zeroing it. So here's the material I'm using for my first two cuts that I'm just about to cut on the CNC. Again, I need to cut 30 inches on these to make sure we have enough room for the faces. What I'm gonna do, when I pick out my material is I'm gonna pick out the cleanest looking boards to be the faces. I don't want knots, I don't want any sort of thing that impacts the look of these lanterns on the front. All of those can get hidden away on the back or the sides. So for the faces, I always pick the cleanest, goodest looking boards and I'll go ahead and cut these 30 inches. And again, I need two of these for this set of seven file. Set these aside, you'll go ahead and use most of the scrap on these projects. So then you'll bring your pieces over to the Onefinity. I've already backed it up to the back left corner just to get it out of the way. I have my Onefinity set up with a T-Track waste board and these are completely perpendicular to the axis. So I know that straight, so I just line it up with one side of this spoil board move it up to where I know it's in range, and then I'll line the second one right up next to it. 
Therefore, I know both of these are completely straight and they'll cut out just fine. And I'm gonna grab my brad nailer and all I'm gonna do is brad nail in the four corners of each board. It'll keep it in place. I don't worry about a brit breaking. It's happened one time. It could happen, that is a liability. But for me, it's not worth it to try and figure out a way to keep all the small pieces from moving around. And so I just run it and I do it efficiently enough that if I break a bit, it's a bummer, but it doesn't ruin the project for me, so. So I'm gonna start against the one that I know is square. These are just 18 gauge brad nails. Two there. I'm gonna go up to the top corner, make sure we're good up here. And then I'm just gonna hold this next board right up next to it. And I'm gonna nail that down. And just like that, these won't move. They'll cut out great. You can actually see there's a little bit of variation in these boards where this one's a little bit higher, this one's a little bit lower. And because of that, I actually zero the machine against the waste board and not the top of the material. That way I know that it's cutting the exact same depth every time. It's not gonna ruin the waste board completely. It's just gonna make it run smoother. And when you batch these out, you can do that way quicker that way if you don't have to worry about the Z axis. So let's zero this off. So to zero this off, I'm just gonna take my touch probe you don't need one of these, but it does help me a lot, so I have one. You'll attach it up to the collet here, and you'll just bring this in, bring that bit all the way down. And I'm gonna zero X and Y going this route by hitting the probe XYZ button. I gotta change the metric of this tool into the correct bit, point one, two, five, and then it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna zero itself three ways, vertically, horizontally, and vertically. Once that's done, I'm actually gonna reset the Z. I don't want the Z, again, from the top of the material. I want it from the base here. So in the cut files, I did program this into cut at 0.6 inch depth for these files. And that means that I'm gonna zero on the waste board and then I'm gonna bump it up 0.6 inches. And that way I know the cut is gonna exactly get through the material but not cut into the waste board. So really quick, let me just show you what I mean. On this specific file, the cut depth is 0.6 inches. Double check this on yours, it may not be that way. And because of that, I know that if I zero the bit at 0.6 inches above the workpiece, that it will cut exactly through the workpiece, but not through the waste board. So I'm gonna go over to the machine and do that. So I'm gonna bring my uh, router off to the side. I'm gonna go ahead and set it up to zero it on the waste board by hitting probe Z. This way again, I'm getting the top of the waste board is the zero point right now. Get rid of the touch probe. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and raise this to 0.6 inches and then it'll cut perfectly. So now I've gotta get the Z axis to 0.6 inches which can be a little pinicky, so I put it on this shortest mode. Point six zero one. I'm just gonna go with that. Point zero zero one inch, ain't gonna mess anything up. And then I am ready to cut the file. So what I gotta do for that is I gotta get my dust boot set up, which I already have. Unfortunately, I cut off some Epoxy, it's pretty messy in there right now. I'll turn the dust boot on. I've already put in the mini Jenny bit into the CNC, so that is ready to roll. And with that, we're gonna throw the dust boot on. I'm gonna turn the dust collection on, and I'm gonna hit play.
This assembles very easily. You've got the top with the stem, goes just like that. Then you've got the front, the sides, the back, just like that. And we put it all together, it'll look something like that. Let's do it for real. So we're gonna start, turn it around, put these brad nails, line it up, no clamps or anything, just fingers. So uh, brad nail on the bottom, brad nail on the top. Now for mine, I always put the stems facing left. You can face them whatever direction you want. It's up to you. But there we go. Frankenstein's ready to roll. I'm gonna assemble it again from the other angle over here so you can see that again. All right, we're gonna assemble one more full speed and then I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks on how to sell and market your lanterns to make you succeed, help you pay off your machine. There we go. Now again, hide any of this as best you can. This one's got it on both sides, but that's a bummer. The glue is not 100% necessary, by the way. I choose to do it. I think it helps me out a little bit, but people do different things and find success in different ways and that's all to you. Now in selling your lights, there's a few things you want to keep in mind. First is I always include some sort of a light to go underneath these. These are cool, don't get me wrong, but when you put something underneath them, they look a whole lot better in the dark. So three options for you. First, there's this puck light. These run, I believe, about a dollar per light. Could be worth investing in. There's these simple LED tea lights that are just yellow, meant to replicate a candle. And then there's the same thing, but in color. When I take my own pictures, I use these lights, I offer them as an upgrade, and then I usually will include color or yellow light and let the customer choose upon pickup. So now that we've got one set of seven lanterns put together, we can start talking about some tips and tricks in selling your lanterns and how to maximize your time, your energy, and your profits. So the first and most important thing in my opinion in selling your lanterns is actually the branding behind them. If you post these awesome lanterns with a horrible sucky picture, nobody's gonna buy your lanterns. It's just the truth. And so what I've done is I go ahead and have my wife who is a professional photographer take some really high end pictures of these lanterns that uh, shows them in kind of the twilight hour. So when it's dark enough to have a light inside, the light lights up, but it's light enough that you can see what they are, see some of the details and kind of put together what's going on here. So when my wife takes the pictures, I'll take them, I'll put them into a collage where I'll easily communicate the number of them. And so when people place an order, they're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That way it helps me out and um, I post those images together. The second part of the branding is making sure that you're clearly communicating what you've got, what the price is and how to pick it up. For me and my lanterns, I price them typically at $25 each, three of them for 65 bucks or all seven, the whole set of seven for 140. It's a little bit of a price break at each point um, and most people take me up on the offer of three for 60. 
For me and my lanterns, I, I kind of sell them in three stages, and each stage looks a little bit different. The first stage starts in late August or right now. And what I do is I go ahead and I put together a set of seven, I put my picture, I make my caption, and I post it in a few different places. First, I post it on Etsy. Second, I post it on Facebook and my personal and business pages. And third, I'll post it in garage sale sites and for sale pages and groups, mostly on Facebook. I see maybe 20 to 30 sales on Etsy of my lanterns. I see quite a few sales, maybe uh, 20 to 30 more coming through through my business page. But the majority of my sales come from the for sale groups or garage sale groups that exist on Facebook. It's the place I sell the most of my product anytime I sell really anything that I got for sale. And what I'll do starting right now is I'll post them for sale as a pre-sale or a pre-order. I'll bump the price down five bucks and I'll take in as many orders as I can to build myself up a number of orders that make sense to batch them out. Last year it was about 60 to 70 lanterns I had on pre-sale. What I do then is I schedule a weekend before the due date that they need to pick up their lanterns and I will spend Friday after work until Sunday night and do an entire batch of lanterns. I'll pick up 100 cedar fence pickets from the store and I will put them all together and I'll just batch them out like crazy. What I make sure I do is that I've provided enough of my lanterns to cover all the pre-sale and then I try and um, project what I think is the most popular lanterns this year and I'll kind of make extras of all my lanterns but in quantities that make sense based on what the pre-sale numbers looked like per design. Once I've got those batched out, I'll go ahead and I'll communicate that I'm selling these lanterns. No more pre-sale, no more uh, pre-orders, none of that. These are available at full price, 25 bucks, three for 65, all seven for 140, and they're available first come, first serve. I let that sit until about two weeks before Halloween comes. And at that point in time, I take a um, inventory of what I've got available and I decide how to move forward. Option one is just waiting on the lanterns until the next year, holding them for 12 months, selling them as is the following year. The option that I usually go with is I just discount my lanterns down to 15 bucks or so, and I will sell them first come first serve to any customer who wants to buy them. Um, all of them priced at 15 bucks, no bulk discounts, nothing like that. Come pick them up if you want them. If not, so be it. But I try and get rid of all the lanterns I've got. Doing this has allowed me to maximize my profit with that normal sale, where again, I'm continuing to post periodically in these different groups on Etsy, throwing money at advertisements, all sorts of stuff like that. And then I'll go ahead and take that and um, finish out my sale by just getting rid of any bulk. I don't wanna store them. Honestly, it's not worth it to me. I've already made the money that I'm gonna make and that's what it's gonna be. Well, I hope this video has been helpful for you. If there's things that you still are wondering or ways of doing things that you suggest, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear some feedback and I'd especially love to know how these lanterns sell in your area. What could be better? What is worth? How can we make this happen? I wanna hear all that in the comments, let me know. Big thanks to Cody over at Cody CNC Engraving. He sent me out some mini jennies. I designed these lanterns to be made exclusively with the mini jenny and doing so has been uh, incredibly efficient for me. I hope that's the way it is for you as well. You can use my code sawdust and stuff over on his website. It's in the description for 10% off your mini jenny. Love to see you using those mini jennies out there. It's the best bit, like I said, on the market. His uh, jenny line is incredible and uh, I love everything about it. So thanks for stopping by the channel. Hope you subscribe, follow, uh, like this video, and again, leave me a comment, let me know what you think. Thanks guys, and we'll see you next time.